welcome back to the third chapter in this episode of Double Click. For the last part of this conversation on the future world of work, we're going to be examining some of the best strategies to optimize your technology stacks. We're going to be delving into the power of automation of intelligence and data to improve outcomes and empower employees. We'll be joined by Marcus Mossberger, the future of work strategist at Infor, and Joshua Whitworth, the chief deputy at the state of Idaho. Don't miss this opportunity to gain actionable insights for driving innovation and staying competitive in your organization today and tomorrow. And if you want to catch the first two chapters in this episode, click the YouTube playlist for double click. With that said, let's get started. Josh, I wonder if you can share a little bit more on the technology stack that you've deployed at the state of Idaho. Talk to us about how it's evolved and how you're currently prioritizing investments. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I always like to say, uh, as we went through our modernization, uh, we went from a 87 uh, Ford with an eight track player to uh, a modern day vehicle that will eventually drive itself with AI, right? And so we made a significant jump in technology because of the need of our workforce to have technology that meets them where they're at. We're gonna be a lot more mobile. My teams can be out there now working wherever they're at. If they're doing an agency visit and sitting down working on something, they have that mobility right in their hands. And, and our old technology stack could not do that. It was immobile, unable to adapt. The bigger thing, and we talk about adaptation, it's, I always say we built this technology with N42 as a foundation. It was never the end goal. It was the beginning of where we might be. And as an evolving state, knowing that that ability in the cloud, the security layers and everything that's around it, is gonna constantly evolve to what is needed in that time, over the next five or 10 or 15 years, I know that I'm gonna have technology that meets my future need as well. And having that ability to our workforce adapt that with them is only gonna allow us to meet the demands that come forward in a growing state like ours. Marcus, what are you seeing from other Infor customers in terms of what their current technology stacks look like and how they're preparing for the future? Yeah, it comes back to once again, solving specific problems that they have today while planning for the future, as you put it. So they've got some immediate needs that they need to address with technology, but they don't want to make bad decisions that doesn't allow them to then build on the foundation that they put in place. So th the technology needs to be adaptable, as you pointed out, because who knows what the world's going to look like five years from now, 10 years from now. You talk about the skills challenge. We're training a next generation for jobs that don't exist yet. Our technology needs to support those jobs that don't exist yet, so it needs to be fundamentally adaptable. I'd love to get both of your thoughts on technology as a healthy accompaniment to business and where you actually see it hindering progress today. Marcus, I would love for you to double click on this first. The topic uh, right now is generative AI, right? And just AI in general, seeing opportunities for automation of administrative transactional things to free up human beings to do what only humans can do. Um, there's a real opportunity there. The, the challenge there, too, is then the change associated with that. And humans don't like change. It's interesting. And we, we talk about change management and how we've had traditional approaches to that for years and years. I, I know, Josh, that you understand the importance of it. I actually think we need to redefine it. It's not change management. That old school command and control, the next generation doesn't love that. It's change enablement. How do you empower people to change? How do you encourage them to change? And not just adapt to the change, but to actually drive it. I think that's the key. I would agree with you. It's, it's the people, right? We can put all these fancy terms with it, but it's really about how we put people in places to be successful, right? Managing change is about getting buy-in. It's about getting people excited about being a part of creating that future. And as we invest in those, uh, building that excitement, that people adopt change without question. It's only when it's forced upon somebody that they don't feel like they have an ownership in it. And so I, I agree with you. As we look at, at building the skill sets of our employees in the state and the rapidness that our organization is gonna change over the next 10 years, we need to build skills that have employees know how to engage in change and know how to enact and, and be a part of that change and not being just sitting back and waiting for a manager to tell them it's your turn, but being okay to bring that idea forward and bring that innovative like 
path that might open up a plethora of opportunities for everybody. And so it's investing in that, in our employees and that skill set. I would say it's also in our management, ensuring that we listen and provide those opportunities for our employees to do that as well. Are there any areas or trends in technology that you really feel are being overlooked by businesses these days? You might call it AI, but it's robotic process automation. It's, it's yep. you know, we get lost in all this, but the more efficient we can make that process through, you know, where you don't have to do a lot of extra steps, to me is, it gets kind of pushed to the side because it's not maybe as fancy as generative AI, but it's equally and probably more efficiency can come out of that in the next uh, few years than anything else in our world. Yeah, totally agree. Um, the, the one additional one I'll add to the mix, I mentioned it earlier, but blockchain's not dead yet. In fact, we're working with clients right now um, in terms of giving people an opportunity to have self-sovereign data about themselves. So think about your data relative to you being an employee. Is that yours or is that your employ employer's? If we use blockchain to credential people, then they can take it with them anywhere they go because it's already been validated. I went to the University of Kansas. That needs to be validated one time in blockchain. Nobody ever needs to do it again. I can use that inside my organization. I can use it outside. So we're seeing blockchain still has some useful potential characteristics. Um, but again, it also has some limitations, but it's not dead yet. If you're interested to learn more about some of the great topics we covered on this episode, follow the instructions on screen now or click the link in the description. And of course, don't forget to hit subscribe and click on the notification bell. What are you seeing in terms of the biggest areas of pushback at the moment? And this can either come from employees or customers. Yeah, I think security will continue to be on the forefront of everything we do, especially as a state. We probably have to take another level because of the uh, expectation of our citizens. I think it just needs to be in the discussion. When you talk about data ownership, I think that's a fantastic idea, right? Because in this world, basically everything you do is tracked somewhere but you don't own it today. I think as we go forward, that's probably that blue ocean that's out there of how does that data actually own and who owns it and who has access to it uh, across the board. Uh, I just think in every dynamic that we speak about technology and data, we need to think of who owns it from the customer base, right? Is it a citizen in the state of Idaho? Is it the organization? Do we need to protect it? And then it's also, well, if it's really theirs, that citizens, then let's make sure that they have the decision rights over you know, what can be used and what cannot be used. So I think one of the biggest challenges that's come up recently, again, coming out of the pandemic, where there's a more of a focus on workforce well-being is personal information. I think the line between personal and professional moved, and I don't think it's moving back. And so there's like this acknowledgement that we're human beings, and therefore maybe it's important that we address your mental health in your physical health and your emotional health and but historically we're like well we can't we can't talk about that at work because that's you know not appropriate but it does impact your performance and your ability to deliver so that's where i think it's going to get tricky like should we be tracking people and saying josh i noticed you only got six hours of sleep last night and you've gained five pounds you doing okay and you're like whoa whoa what did you say how do you know that but but that's potentially where we're going is being able to track you know, some characteristics about people that historically might have been off limits. And so again, that's where the privacy piece comes into play. Some people will be like, you can track everything. I know you are anyway, so you may as well use it for my benefit. And others are like, no, 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 that's not okay. I don't know if you'll ever overcome it because there's, there's definitely a cultural acceptance, especially with social media, that things are just public and it's okay. Uh, but there's also a, what can that information be used? And I think when you cross that line, especially as a, as a government, Right? It comes with a connotation of what's that slippery slope too bad. Uh, so I think leaders just need to draw a line, even though you can, you should not utilize those. And, and then allow the user base to control what they wish to allow. I, I agree. I, I think the key is giving people choices and, and the ability to opt in or the ability to opt out. So I'll, I'll give you another example of where this comes into play. We're all familiar with the concept of work-life balance. So for a lot of people, they're like, work and life are separate, distinct things. But 
over the last decade or so, there's this new concept of work-life integration or work-life harmonization has become a little bit more prevalent. And so, again, I think what we have to do is acknowledge that everyone's different. Some people are like, you know, I, I don't want a distinction between my, I, I'm working at 10 o'clock at night, I'm going for a walk at 10 in, in the morning, I don't care, it, it's no different to me. Other people are like that, that's not okay, I'm not working at 10 o'clock at night. So you have to respect the differences of individuals. So I don't think there's ever gonna be a point where we've reached the plateau and everybody's okay. I think we need to recognize people's different perceptions. Finally, I'd love to double click on both your thoughts in terms of successfully navigating the challenges that we've uncovered today. What are your top tips for organizations when it comes to identifying, assessing technologies that are already in place and preparing for the future? I would say the single biggest thing uh, is to ask the question why you do something. And if you approach uh, both the problem or the technology or where you're going in the future with why you do it, you can construct the future that is adaptable and going forward. Too many times when we approach a problem with the thinking that we brought with us and don't know why that we need to do something, we tend to build what we know. And I would say given where AI is going, given where the technology stack ahead, understanding the why first and building up from there is probably the most critical thing that will prove success for any organization doing this. First and foremost, engage your people in the evaluation process, in the decision-making process, in the implementation process, um, because the frontline folks are the ones that are gonna be able to help you deliver the most value out of any technology, and as we t discussed earlier, then the adoption of the technology will improve. The second thing I would say is, and Josh actually mentioned it earlier, you need to take some risks. The risk aversion that I see is really problematic, like in healthcare. We see the medical side of healthcare take dramatic risks in medicine because people are like, I'm willing to try something that isn't proven because I'm dying or because I have a real serious illness. But on the administrative operational side, they're so risk averse. And I'm sure it's true in public sector too. We've got to change that. And so that requires us to be a lot more open-minded. And again, that's one of the positives that came out of the pandemic. I think people are more open-minded now to new ways of working and thinking about how work gets done. So, you know, I think that needs to be a big priority. And that's a wrap on this episode of Double Click. I wanna thank both of you for your fascinating, really outstanding contributions to this program. And I wanna thank all of you who tuned in. We hope you heard some great practical recommendations and advice and that you'll join us on the next episode of Double Click. Be sure to subscribe for more great content.